Many of you might remember this. Bob Dylan captured the mood of the country when he wrote a song called The Times, They Are Changing. And what a timely song it was. The president had been assassinated. Civil rights were being fought for by African Americans across the country. There was a nationwide recognition that poverty was serious and we needed to do something about it. We were struggling with how to navigate being a superpower with the Soviet Union and, and what we were going to do when communists were in our hemisphere. What were we going to do with them? Music was evolving and it was different. It lacked some of the structures that we had known in music before. Culture was evolving. Women were being liberated. And Dylan said, the times, they are a changing. This week, I have had that song in my mind all week. The times, they are a-changing. Let me tell you why I was so proud to be a part of this church. I don't think I saw anybody in this church write on Facebook, oh no, what are we going to do? Things are getting horrible. What are we going to do? You just kind of were filled with grace and you just kind of walked through and you never looked like you were shaken or that you were afraid. You just knew that love wins. God is love, everything's going to be okay. I wish that were true of all of my friends, but that was not true of all of my friends. Some of my friends who had been pastors for 30, 40, 50 years, they got on Facebook and they were hysterical. What is going to happen now? God is going to judge America. Someone posted this, and I thought it was so great. You don't think, if God didn't send down fire on America when Europeans came here and took over Indian lands and exterminated them in large number, or when we enslaved a whole race of people for a long, long time, or when we established laws that kept them from being able to vote or be a part of our society, or all the things that we've done in history, you think that God is wringing his hands now? That just seems so crazy. Others wrote about God's judgment. It seemed like that was a big deal. But not you. None of you seemed like you were shaken. And I thought, that's mature. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know who's on the throne. You know who's in charge. And you know things are going to be okay. You're, you're, you're going to preach with me today. I can tell. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. I'm working on it. I'll try. I will try. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. My purpose this morning is not to try to give a theological treatise on LGBT issues. That's not what I want to do today. But what I want to do is I want to talk to you about how mature people process change. How mature people understand and see this world that is a changing. What do we remember if we're followers of Christ? What do we hold on to? What helps us navigate through the waves of change that are happening all around us? And I think if you get this, and I think many of you already have this, but if you really get this and hang on to this, I think this will be something that you'll, will help you the rest of your life. It's really just three simple statements. But these three simple statements will help you. So with pen in hand, I want you to write down what you need to remember when times around you are changing. And the first thing is this, God is with me. God is with me. Write that down. God is with me. I can't tell you how many times I have said this and then I have cringed when I have gotten away from the circumstance or I've heard other people say it and I've thought, well, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. You've heard this when someone has said, boy, we were doing this and we were doing that and then God showed up. Y'all have heard that? And then God showed up. Now, I understood the person's enthusiasm. I have understood my enthusiasm when I've said that, but it makes me stop and think for a moment. If God shows up, then prior to that, where is God? Where did he come from that he would show up now? And if he is showing up now for me, why is he not showing up somewhere else for somebody else? I've heard it a lot and I've said it a lot. We just need God to show up. You probably said it too. How many times have we sung songs like this? God, please come down. 
to me. God, please come near. Please come. I've seen something good happen, and people describe it as a God thing. Boy, this miracle happened. It was a God thing. But what about an ordinary day? Is an ordinary day a God thing? Just thinking. I believe the problem with this conception of God is that it raises endless questions about when and where and why God chooses to act or not act. And I want you to know something. God doesn't show up. God is always present, always present. Let me tell you a story from the Old Testament. Great story. Jacob, uh, one of the patriarchs in the lines of the patriarch, Jacob had done a lot of bad stuff, and he was having to run for his life. He was moving out of town. He moved from Beersheba um, to a place called Haran. His first night on the road, now, these people basically believed that God was in their little area. That's where he was. But on Jacob's first night on the road, he has a dream, and he wakes up the next morning, and he says, you know what I've figured out? God is here. He not only was in Beersheba, but he's here in Haran. And he said, I am going to call this place Bethel, meaning the house of God. I have figured out God is here. God is here. My point, God is with you. Look at what David said. David wrote this in the Psalm, Psalm 139. He said this, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same. To you, God is with me, always with me. In changing times, he's with me. Jesus would teach about this. He would say, God sees every bird that falls from the sky. God sees the lilies of the field. God knows Everything that you need, God is always with you. The Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, Our Father, which art in heaven, which art in heaven means as near as the air that we breathe. Our God who is all around us. In fact, Jesus' very name, Emmanuel, meant God with us. Do you remember what Jesus taught as he was about to be ascended to the heavens? He said this, Matthew chapter 28, Go therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. I used to have an old preacher, and he and I used to do crusades together. And he would get on the stage, and he would talk about how afraid he was of flying. And I would say, John, you shouldn't be afraid of flying. Don't you know Jesus said he would be with you always? And my preacher friend would say, no, Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. <laughs> Low, not high, but low. My point is, in changing times, when you don't know exactly what's going on, you don't push the panic button. You remember first and foremost, he is with me. He is with me. Second thing I want you to write down is this. God is for me. God is for me. Now, this is a progressive understanding. This is a bigger step. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this. Now, he's talking to people that felt like they were outside of the religious circle. They did not feel like they were a part of the, the in crowd. All right? They've got issues. They're poor. They're not really accepted in the established world of a Judaism. They're just kind of on the outside. But Jesus said this. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. And he keeps going all the way down through verse 12. It's one of the first teachings uh, that Jesus gives publicly. And in this teaching, he announces that God's blessings are on those who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who aren't on top of the world, who have their issues, God's blessing rests on them. Now, I want you to write this down. Bless means God is on my side. God is on my side. He's for me. He's not against me. 
The reason this is so important to understand is over the last 30 plus years as a pastor, I have met and spoken to hundreds of thousands of people who felt like if they could only get better, if they could only become more moral, more disciplined, more spiritual, more kind, more courageous, more holy, more righteous, then somehow they would be accepted or embraced or valid, validated or affirmed by God. I've been asked by many, many people, isn't that really the only thing that matters, that you become a good person? Now listen, I understand, I want everybody to be good, a good person. That's a good, noble thing. But it sounds as if you think if you can somehow be good, then that will somehow or another kind of cause God to be benevolent to you. It's subtle, but it reflects a belief that God works on some kind of merit system. If you're good or right or decent or religious, then you'll get points that you need to get God on your side. But that's not the good news. That's not the good news. The good news is the shocking, provocative, subversive, counterintuitive good news that in your moments of greatest despair, your moments of greatest failure, your moments of greatest sin, your moments of greatest weakness, of losing, of failing, of falling, of frustration, of inability, of helplessness, or wandering, or falling, exactly in that moment, God is there for you. He's there for you. He is pulling for you. He is on your side. The gospel insists that God doesn't wait for us to get ourselves polished up, shined up, proper, without blemish. God comes to us and he meets us and he blesses us while we're still in the middle of the mess that we created. That's the good news. You may be here this morning and you're saying, Ray, I'm in a mess. I have created a mess. I've been there. I get it. You know what? God is with you. He is for you. He will help you. The gospel isn't getting us together so we can have God's favor by being certain goodness the gospel is us finding God exactly in that moment of our greatest need. Gospel is grace, and grace is a gift, and you don't earn a gift, you simply receive the gift. Amen. Give you a cool thought, because this is a smart crowd. I know you're a smart crowd. I want you to look at this scripture in Matthew chapter 5. In this first Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 45. God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, I want you to stay with me. God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus, in an agricultural setting, one in which people were acutely aware of the needs for the sun and the rain to grow their crops so they wouldn't starve, everybody had their own personal list of who was good, who was bad, who was in, who was out. Jesus said... God blesses the good and the bad. He blesses the righteous and he blesses the unrighteous. That is a huge thought. And I point this out because at the heart of Jesus' message is the call for us to be the kind of person who is for everybody. I love seeing Christians that are just for everybody. They want everybody to win. They want everybody to be blessed to have the best. They just are pulling for everybody. It discourages me when Christians want to draw circles and say, they're the enemy over there. We're the good guys, they're the enemy. God causes it to rain on people inside your circle and outside your circle. He causes the sun to rise on the people inside your circle and outside your circle. If God can do that, shouldn't we be able to do that as well? One of my favorite verses is Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's why we don't wring our hands. He's with us. He's for us. And the third thought I want you to get, and I think many of you have this, is this. What do I need to remember when times around me are changing? God is also ahead of me. God is ahead of me. He's with me, he's for me, but he's also ahead of me. Now, here's a big question. I want you all to really think. You think through this, all right? Is God progressive with a better, more inspiring vision for our future than we could ever imagine? Or 
is God behind us, back there somewhere in the past, trying to get us to return to how it used to be? Think that through. That's the most important question you will ask yourself today. Is God in front of us urging us to a better future than we ever dreamed? Or is he behind us saying we've got to go back to some idealistic understanding of yesterday? This is the central question of our times. Is the best future a return to an imagined pristine era when things were ideal? And let me just say this because I think, I think our, everybody here will get this, but I just want to say it because people that don't go to our church, they don't understand this. When Caucasians who are Christians talk about going back to the way things used to be, that that somehow was the righteous time. Can I tell you our African-American brothers don't get on that page? Because that didn't seem so righteous to them. You understand, if you go back to the 1950s when life seemed simpler, our black brothers and sisters weren't even allowed to vote in Georgia. They weren't allowed to use the same facilities that we use. They weren't allowed to sit at counters at restaurants. You understand, when you think back there was somehow better than where we are today, you show a super misunderstanding of history. It wasn't better for everybody back then. It was simpler. There wasn't as many channels on the TV. We didn't have the internet where you could see everything at, at a, just in an instant, but it wasn't great. Uh, the church I grew up in was still meeting blacks at the door and saying, you can't go to church here, and if you try to go to church here, we'll, we'll make sure that you don't. Why would I want to go back to something idealistic that wasn't so? It wasn't so. People who think that the founders of our nation were somehow superior Christians to the Christians that are in the world today, Listen, they were wonderful. They were wonderful, but they were flawed. They owned people. They owned people. They had to, we had to evolve in our understanding of how things are. So, so is God in front of us pulling us into a better future, or is he behind us wanting us to go back to a past that wasn't nearly as great as you imagine it to be in the first place. Now, I want to give you a few scriptures because this is interesting to me. Maybe it'll be interesting to you. In the Bible, in Exodus chapter 21, there's this little scripture. You'll remember this. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint a penalty for life, for life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. So, we all know that, and, and we look back and we say, boy, that was kind of brutal. I mean, if you got in a fight with somebody and their eye got poked out, then guess what? Your eye would get poked out. After this edict, your eye would get poked out, and we say, golly, that sounds so harsh. But can I tell you something? This was a huge step forward for civilization. Before this edict was given, if you poked my eye out, and I could, I would not only kill you and your family and everybody in your family, I would kill everybody. That's how... That's how I could respond if I wanted to. But God's edict comes down and says, no, we're going to take a step forward. We're going to take a step forward. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's going to be equal. It's going to be equal. And then Jesus takes us a step forward. We now have courts of law. We take a step forward. We move and we understand in a better way, right? You understand? Revenge, left unchecked, always escalates. This is supposed to help us not escalate to something beyond it's a step forward we look back at it now and we say wow that seems primitive but if you were there at the time it was a huge step forward let me give you another one this is one of those scriptures that you, you really hate when it's read publicly and people don't understand it because it sounds really bad Deuteronomy chapter 21 when you go to war this is the laws for how you're going to operate in war when you go to war against your enemies and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands and you take captives if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and you're attracted to her, you may take her as your wife. 
Doesn't that make you cringe just a little bit? It's like, man, you just killed her husband. She's good looking. And you say, hmm, come and be my wife. Bring her into your home. Have her shave her head, trim her nails, put aside the clothes she was wearing when captured. After she has lived in your house and mourned her father and mother for a full month, then you may go to her and be her husband and she shall be your wife. If you're not pleased with her, let her go wherever she wishes. You must not sell her or treat her as a slave since you have dishonored her. Now, this sounds brutal to me at first reading. What a primitive, barbaric, demeaning, and degrading passage. How could anyone with an ounce of respect for women find this passage anything but offensive or repulsive and a giant step backwards as it relates to females? But that's because we're looking at it here. If we knew what was going on back there, this was a huge step forward. The passage relates to the spoils of war. What do you do in war? It was customary that whoever won the battle took whatever belonged to the now dead adversary. Whatever belonged to the person I'm just killed is now mine. You could take their wives. She would be your property and you could do with whatever you wanted to. But this passage, God moved people forward. To take her into your house meant you were going to be providing for her. You would give her a roof over her head, protection, food, clothes, whatever else she needed. Second, when it said she would need to shave her head and trim her nails and change her clothes, this meant you were allowing her to mourn. This was, she was entering a period of mourning. This was a good thing. You were to give her a month to be able to mourn her loss. Third, to make her your wife meant she was now a fully functioning member of your household. She had responsibilities. She had rights. She had position. When a man in that day was not pleased with a woman, he was free to send her away into a culture where she had no rights and had to often uh, go and become a prostitute. But this text says, no, you can't do that. You're going to have to release her with dignity. This passage forbids sending a rejected woman away without rights and honor and dignity. My point is, God seems to be in front of people pulling them forward. We look from here and we say, Boy, the Bible is so primitive. Well, in many ways it is. That's, that's 5,000 years ago. That's pretty primitive. But if we were there, we would say, wow, God has just given them a huge step forward. A huge step forward. What we see in the Bible is God meeting people right where they are and calling them to a higher level of peace. Shalom. God meets people where they are and he draws them forward. If people are at point B... God is moving them to point C. If people are at point L, God is moving them to point M. If people are at point W, God is moving them to point Y. God is always moving us forward. That's why when people want to say, let's go back to the morality of the Bible, and fundamentalists say that, and I can talk about fundamentalists because I was raised a fundamentalist, all right? I know fundamentalism. But they don't understand that these stories are set in a context that made sense. But if you try to go from a, 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 an M where we may be today and you say, no, let's go back to the Bible and do it the way the Bible says, you may be going back to a B or a C. That was right at the time. That's not right now. God is moving us forward where there's more embrace, there's more love, there's more acceptance, there's more forgiveness, there's more grace, there's more love there's more care and concern in every way important for us to understand that that's why jimmy keeps hammering and i keep hammering on this it doesn't get higher than love god and love people love god and love people treat them the way you want to be treated again when people get all they, they get all upset about things they're wanting to go back and they're wanting to use verses that were applicable in the day, but God is, Jesus said this in, in John 16. I wish I'd put it on the screen. Jesus said in John 16, I have so many things I wish I could tell you, but you're not ready. I have so many things I wish I could tell you, but you're not ready. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will lead you. He will lead you. So we don't wring our hands. We love God. We trust that he's in us for us and pulling us into the future that he wants us to be in. I want to say one other thing, and again, I want to say this because I, I was raised a fundamentalist, and I get this. The people that wring their hands and want to pound the scriptures the most, their track record 
has not been good. Their track record has not been good. Now, I'm grateful for the things I learned about Jesus in my upbringing. I'm very grateful for that. But fundamentalists took a stand that slavery was okay in the Bible. Therefore, it should be okay in our country. That's the side the fundamentalist was on. Thankfully, there were Christians that said, no, God is pulling us into a more equal future. God is pulling us ahead. Sure, you've got verses where Paul said, if you're a slave, then be a good slave. But that doesn't mean that God wants people to be slaves. Thankfully, others were saying, God's pulling us ahead. The same thing was true with women. Fundamentalists loved keeping women down. Women weren't allowed to speak in church because the Bible says, you know, let women remain silent in the church. And so that was a verse they could hang on to and they could keep women down. Thankfully, there were other Christians who said, you know what, Paul also said in Christ there's neither slave nor free, male nor female, Greek nor Jew. Isn't God pulling us into something where it's equal? Isn't that where God is, isn't that love God, love others, treat people the way you want them to treat you? Isn't, doesn't that make sense? And it's like, thankfully, there were Christians who were saying that, and it was as if God was pulling us ahead. Divorce. My dad came over to the house yesterday and he and I were talking and he said, you know, when he was a boy, he said if a woman was divorced, it didn't matter if the husband had been a scoundrel, if the woman was divorced, she was basically uh, put out from the church, totally put out from the church. Well, there's verses that could make you think that's the way and maybe those verses were real important taking somebody from point A to point B. But if you're at point M in understanding God and openness and grace, then maybe that's a huge step backwards, not a step forwards. Same thing with interracial marriage. I remember when I went to Brazil in 1981, I had never seen more beautiful people in my life, but so much of it was there had been intermarrying of different races and it was as if there were no racial lines to me. And in 1981, I had never seen anything like it. And I remember still hearing preached in the church how sinful that was. And now we look back and we say, that's silly. That's silly. God is pulling us forward. God is pulling us forward. Well, my point to all of you is, for each of us, when the world is changing and shifting, we remember God is with us. We remember he's for us. And you remember that he is pulling society to a better world, to a better world. Sometimes it gets off track. I'm not saying it works perfectly in every way. But I do know we don't have to wring our hands. We don't have to be writing God is going to send down judgments for people just being more accepting and more loving to our friends. And I think that's good news. I think that's very good news, and it made me very proud to be your pastor and not see any of the hand-wringing that I saw from so many others. We're going to share communion now, and I want to say this about communion. To me, communion is the most precious time because it is an opportunity for us as representatives of Christ to say you're invited to his table. When you hold the bread and the wine in your hand, it is as if Jesus himself has served you. You're actually holding representations of his body and his blood. And he is saying to each of you, you are welcomed at his table. And I want you to know this. Some of you say, I don't know that I'm good enough to sit at his table. You know what? If we had to be good enough, none of us could ever sit at his table. But he invites each of us to receive his grace. So I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward down to the front and stand at the table and I want to say a prayer and then I'm going to ask them to deliver the elements to you and then hold the elements in your hand and then when everyone has been served I will lead us in a prayer and we will partake of each of the elements but for right now I'm just going to ask you to pray Father we thank you for this day we thank you for allowing us to not only think about your word and think about how you're in us and with us and ahead of us and you're moving in ways we can't even imagine, but how you also love us and invite us to sit at your table, that you really are for us. 
I pray, Father, that this communion will be meaningful to all of us as we think about how much you love us, how much you want for us the best life. And I pray this in Christ's name.